Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to one of the first sessions of uh, TLMS 2020. Uh, my name is Stuart Hayes. I'll be your MC today. Uh, we can decide later if that's a good or a bad thing. I have uh, the distinct pleasure of introducing, and I'm going to do my best work in my finish here, Jako Limpenen, who works with ILA, a Finnish public broadcaster. Um, uh, Jako and I were just connecting before we started, and, and I was saying how it's pretty much the idea of anything with the word Netflix in it uh, generates interest when it comes to data and how to link that into sort of customer experience and behavior. Um, so I'm certainly really, really interested in this and, and how they're kind of, in his words or in Copic's words, uh, out the only streaming service beating out Netflix. Um, I want to understand what that means, certainly from a customer experience standpoint, which is what Yako's role is over at uh, Yila, his head of customer experience. Certainly want to understand the customer experience metrics, but certainly a lot of the other data. He's got about 10 plus years, uh, actually pushing 20, I should say, in data and advanced analytics. Uh, he's a strong uh, follower of the media industry for both commercial and public media. And I was doing a little bit of research in 2008. Uh, in his words, he saw the lights when he took his keen interest and experience as it pertains to technology. Uh, a few years, few years later, he saw his role evolving into understanding customers and behavior through artificial intelligence and machine learning. Certainly a passion and interest of mine, looking forward to it. Yako, please, over to you. Looking forward to what you have to teach us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, I'm gonna just right jump into, into my presentation. Great to be here. Great to be sharing our experiences and uh, from Finland, uh, it's a little long way from Toronto, but uh, at least internet brought us together. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit of our um, kind of like strategy, how we are approaching the streaming service business here in, in Finland and, and why we consider ourselves uh, also going to show you a little data why why we think we are the only ones no actually we're not we don't we just don't think we actually kind of like no we are we are still at least beating out netflix uh here in finland and, and i actually haven't heard in anywhere else in, in the world that there would be one that also does the same but yeah straight to the presentation a little background Stuart just told me a little bit a few more about uh, things about me I used to work in the startup business uh, when I, before turning into media business, that was like approximately 13 years ago. Uh, worked for a commercial part before joining uh, Ule, Finnish public broadcaster, uh, four years ago, and has been working with the data and AI solutions, uh, mostly creating better customer experience with it, just not playing around with data and AI only. Uh, also, my if you ever, ever want to learn Finnish and uh, understand uh, crazy bad humor about beer and analytics, we also host notoriously unknown podcasts for, for that purpose. few words if you don't know anything about Finland or Finnish public broadcaster. Finnish, Finland is a, a population of 5.5 million people. Yle, we reach out for 96% of the population uh, altogether weekly. Uh, we have TV channels, radio channels, uh, but you know, we are in the same media business like everyone else in the world at the moment. We are uh, battling all the time of the focus and the time that people have. And we're doing that uh, obviously by our traditional broadcast channels, but lately, especially with our web services, Arena, which is the streaming service. And also we have a current affairs sports news service called Uleda Day 5. Uh, mostly focused on that part. Then on top of that, we also have some uh, solutions for special interest groups, but that kind of key gives you an, uh, an holistic uh, understanding of our company. So we kind of do a lot of stuff, but there are a few things where we really try to do well. One of the things we do quite well is our streaming service, uh, Yle Arena. Um, uh, it's the most valued digital brand in Finland. Uh, this year as well, 2020, uh, also most downloaded mobile app in Finland. And we are just reaching 1 billion stream starts this year with our streaming service. That's, so that's kind of like, a, I don't know if that number sounds high for you guys, but if you consider that there is only 5.5 million people living in Finland, so that's 
Uh, it's, it's only for Finnish people, the service. So that's kind of like a big number for us. So I'm going to talk about two things today. Why focus on personal media experience? Uh, how do you benefit from it? And then I'm going to talk about Arena. So if this is OK for everyone, uh, then let's move on. Uh, why do we care about personal media experience? So first of all, uh, this kind of, you know, the famous Jeff Bezos things yesterday's wow quickly becomes today's ordinary. That's kind of the stuff for us, what we consider also all the time, that if your company cannot reinvent uh, itself all the time, and if it just can't, can like always get a little bit better every day, so then it kind of like starts to fade away eventually. So that's something what we're all the time considering how to, uh, create new culture within our company that develops. Uh, the second part is the, in the media sector, uh, the definition of success is rapidly changing. So now we are everybody's talking, still kind of like talking about Netflix. And uh, now, uh, now we are seeing at least in Finland, Disney Plus is getting all the time bigger. HBO, I don't know what they're doing. They're always. Um, but we see all the time new players coming in the market. And if you only try to be the biggest, maybe that's not the way to be the most successful. So that's really important to understand. You have to understand what success actually means in media business. And also finding the balance. How do we transform the time people choose to spend it with us into something really valuable? And that's kind of like the constant battle, battle for us. What should change in the media? Um, I think a lot of media companies are in the same position like we were uh, a few years ago, five, six years ago. So we started to like really uh, think about like how to put content design and tech skills together. And, and we did the same thing like everyone else does so that we kind of like put the design and the tech skills together and thought that, okay, we have the content there and then we have this beautiful user experience and now everybody can enjoy them and enjoy it. And obviously that doesn't work. So what happened was that we started to consider in the beginning of a few years ago, we started to consider the content also a crucial part of or critical part of the whole uh, media experience environment or ecosystem what we try to create. So that means like dynamic content, social presence, uh, story formats, recommendations, and, and such. Those are really critical part of the content. And content is not something that comes from the heaven to us, but it's something we need to kind of evolve and develop uh, at the same time as we are uh, developing these new AI skills or machine learning skills within our services. And obviously thinking all the time the design, how do we uh, give, uh, give the content to people? So yes, I'm gonna show you just a few things what we are working with. If you find any of these interesting, please do contact and we can talk a little bit more about them. But uh, uh, if you think about the user experience part, we're doing a lot of recommendation system post to our streaming service, but also that our journalistic part, uh, uh, we're developing new kind of uh, application notifications like to our uh, news app, Uutisvahti, uh, uh, and also, um, and the other part, if we think about how AI loves content and what can we work with content, there's a lot of uh, stuff what we are doing at the moment. And that's something what we are focusing at the moment, especially how do we help journalistic people or content creators to become better content creators. Uh, also things what we do in a marketing part, that's really, really important part for us as well. We need to get people understand what we have, what, what is in our service, how do we can uh, present our content to the uh, users as well as we need to communicate the results better to our own people. Uh, we have to create new ways of uh, uh, like of operationalization, uh, recommendation, how as journalistic people understand how recommendations, for example, work, what should we learn about recommendations and such. As well as there is also the customer experience part we need to communicate better to users. Why do we recommend what do we what we recommend to them? Why do we create this kind of content that we have? As well as we need to communicate the same things to our own people. Uh, what kind of data tools 
do you need to do your work better or to help to do your work better if you so choose so this is something what we've learned about organizing ai development within our company uh, during the last six years five five to six years so everything starts from chaos like everybody someone comes to your company and says like, okay you know um uh, you need to do recommendation systems and that was the same thing for us we kind of like start someone just started to do it and then we kind of like where should we do this and at some point then we moved to okay we need to put everything centralized to some one team that they do everything for everyone and then what happened was that we couldn't recruit people because they're the backlogs were huge and we couldn't operate uh, like put things to production because the team was all the time uh, kind of like struggling under the pressure of all the things that they couldn't do. So we kind of moved along to decentralizing of the old whole team. The teams were working within the business units. And obviously what happened then was that we didn't share learnings. We didn't share any ideas. And eventually there was also uh, something that happened with the uh, data quality issues that people didn't communicate better with each other. So then we went to hybrid model, and this is where we are at the moment. And that's kind of the idea that uh, we are working in in part centralized. We are sharing learnings, we are sharing models, we are sharing data sets, as well. We at the same time when we are working with the business units to do the actual development and find the value for the models. But what we've learned also is that in the end we are on our way to back to chaos because. Things are getting, uh, it's always kind of like a circle of life that uh, when something's working really well, there we are now facing like new, new kind of questions to our development teams. And that's something what we are now at the moment thinking that uh, maybe the only thing what we need to embrace in this picture is the idea that it's constantly changing. So there we shouldn't be organizing everything. We just, we need to embrace the change. And how we do it all, obviously, is that all of our um, uh, development is done in a lean and agile way. And this is something that always creates a little discussion that can it be done in such a way. But for us, for us at least, it has been working really well for the few last years. So everything is uh, uh, transparent. Every, everyone can join in, jump in. Everyone can ask questions about what we are doing. Uh, how should we work with these things and, and, and so on. And this is something that you need to put all, all, all at the same time to the same kind of uh, um, picture that you understand that it's not only about it's not only about creating great models, but it's also changing ways uh, editorial people are working or people who work with content, how they're working, you need to change their work as well at the same time. So they need to be invited to the same processes. Uh, as where you as where you are working at the moment so this is the culture is really really important for us and that's something that uh, helps us to develop our own processes the next part is that what does success look like for us so i think this is everyone who works with the uh, media industry this is quite uh, familiar data so the tv is the blue line and the digital is the red line uh, uh two and, uh, and almost three years ago our digital services that they surpassed our tv uh, reach among younger audiences so this is craft is only about under 45 year old people and and that's kind of like if your success looks like this then you kind of like you don't know anything <laughs> and that that's because uh, the both both uh, lines tell different story they tell you obviously that your digital reach is better than your tv reach or broadcast reach but it doesn't tell you like where does the actual uh, usage come from who are the users why do they use what what are their motivation and such so uh, and especially when it comes to the digital world because when this is kind of like typical and everybody always waits for for kind of like the it's circulating back to the things that happened one year ago and see like what happened like in year by year comparison like if you want to predict or oh, maria carrey all i want for a christmas song you kind of like from the 2004 you can predict that okay here we go again and now it's starting to come back again if you just look for google ad search 
um, or Google keyword search numbers. And you can see that the trend is coming up. And this is kind of like typical if you're working in the business where everything happens yearly. But that that's not the case in, in the digital world. Uh, like for example, good example for 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 us is the whole thinking of the living room. Uh, media was all only about the mobile for so many years, but now during COVID times, we are actually one one of the biggest changes is is our smart TV usage. And now again, if you only consider smart TVs to be uh, platforms for streaming content, video content, you're completely wrong. Because at the moment in Finland, for example, uh, Spotify is in number 10 on the most used applications uh, in a smart TV environment. So people don't use uh, smart TVs anymore to view only videos. They use it only also to stream audio content. And that's kind of like a, a really interesting part because there's two changes going on at the same time. So people are moving from a broadcast TV to applic uh, like streaming service usage and actually from video content to audio content. And that's that's kind of these are the things you need to understand at the same time when you try to understand what's actually happening in people's head. And about the Netflix part, this is something what we follow. We have been following since 2015. Uh, how is Netflix doing? How are we doing at the same time? This is also under 45 years old in Finland. And uh, if you compare, if you compare us like with the whole population of Finland, obviously we are much, much, much more huge than Netflix. But if it's just like the interesting uh, consumer target groups, like the under 45 years old, even with those people, we are at the moment uh, reaching more usage than the Netflix is in Finland. Uh, and the latest numbers also show that we are going to be even bigger, uh, bigger in the future. Um, but you know, following numbers is really hard. There are a lot of biases that uh, affect to us. Action bias being one, another one being survivorship bias. So uh, the other one being that you don't believe in action bias, being you don't believe in numbers, you just want to do something. And the other one being survivorship bias that you only uh, follow data that you have and you don't understand the data that you don't have and then do your decision based on that information. And that's that's something what we are also working at the moment really much. How do we change people thinking around numbers? And for example, our uh, recommendation system also tries to uh, grow diversity in their usage of the content. So they're not only, we're not only promoting or we're not only trying to promote the most used or most watched content, but we, we try to uh, promote more diverse content to people so that they would find different kinds of things to watch more than kind of the same thing for everyone. So that's kind of one of the biggest battles for us, what we are doing. But let's talk about the balance. Let's talk about the case arena and what we are doing there. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little story of, our, of, of one development project that um, uh, what we did, and that kind of like explains how things change in, in within our organization. Um, but as you know, all organizations are power and communication structures. So this is something uh, where we start. And for us, it means that we need to always maximize psychological safety so where does the ideas come from they don't come they don't come from the bosses or committees they come from developers and and the professionals so for us the case study where we started up this project was arena's front page quite popular page 500,000 visits every day um again remember 5.5 million people in finland so that's a quite remarkable number uh, but the problem for us was that not a significant proportion of those visits didn't lead to start, especially with the problematic target groups. So we kind of like were wondering, wondering around the problem, like, OK, what we should we do? And, and then one uh, developer came to me and said, OK, I have this idea. We, we should do the uh, artwork personalization. And as I was like, oh, okay, that sounds really good. Let's 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 do that. And then we went to talk to our streaming service developers and say that, okay, we want to do this. And their uh, answer, immediate answer was to us, no, 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 that it, it, there's no effect of doing that. There's no use doing that. 
uh, that's a complete waste of time. And then we showed them that actually Netflix is doing this already. And after that, they said, okay, yeah, you can do that as well to us. But what we didn't understand in that point was that actually, uh, when we do this uh, contextual banding model, um, we actually start to increase the amount of understanding of elements to our journalistic people as well. So this was one of our first experiments what we did in, in uh, Arena. And already in here, we start to see like kind of like uh, uh, what what what's the thing that actually changes? So we start to understand that okay, uh, males they appreciate strong, males watching straight to your eyes, females on a certain age they kind of like more into emotions. Uh, younger female audiences they go for more than strong female characters, and uh, nobody likes middle-aged men looking to an emptiness. And that that was kind of the situation for us that okay. Uh, this was some, this was some, some like, like new kind of information we didn't ever have before because we only did A-B tests before. So that kind of told us that if you put these four, uh, the bottom left picture is the best because it reached the most uses. And then you offered the same picture to everyone. And actually what happens there is that you forget a lot of different kind of target groups that would appreciate different kind of images. So for us, it means that, okay, there has to be something more to investigate on this. And, and that's kind of led to us also start to try new experience. And when we did a lot of rounds, we did a lot of experiments after that. And, and that's kind of uh, was the issue that, okay, um, we, we start to see that uh, we can create a lot of more viewing uh, uh, with the only artwork personalization, but we also start to understand that almost every time the things our editorial people chooses to be the best artwork actually didn't work at all. So nine times nine times out of ten, machines got it right, and and that kind of like changed all of our uh, whole uh, UI design process where we think that okay, the people should be in a power situation in the middle choosing what does the masses see and that was the biggest change for us was that actually uh, ai should decide what people see and people should focus focus mostly on creating better uh, pictures better uh, content better stories behind the system and let machine do the most of the work in the user interface part but for us obviously we had some issues uh, if we wanted to do more picture, pictures for our uh, shows, it meant a tremendous amount of work that what we should do. And actually, it also meant that it would never happen. So we want, needed to look closer that could machines help us also create the images for, for the TV show. And again, this was something we started to uh, battle with our editorial people. And first response was obviously that Maybe this is not a good, good idea. Maybe, maybe it doesn't work that well, but we were kind of like uh, trusting it. Okay, let's see what happens. And if it works, let's see what happens after that. And, and kind of maybe you know all the, all the stuff. Uh, in, in 27 minutes, you have approximately 34,000 pictures. Uh, and, and it's quite easy to technically uh, filter out unusable uh, images. Uh, they're too dark, there's movement and such. So, so basically our model uh, computes stillness, luminance and sharpness scores for e every image on the film. And, and uh, after that, we have the sample size of, of different kind of images that could work or which uh, like quality uh, levels are yeah, enough good. And, and after, that, after that, we convert each pre-filtered image to uh, HSV, hue saturation value space and to grayscale. And from grayscale, uh, we create image pyramids, compute histograms, and concentrate to a feature vector so that we can start to compare images to each other. And, and obviously cluster uh, images to see that uh, we don't want to find the same images from the same parts of, of, the, of the show. And, and this kind of like we helps us also to find best images from different uh, shots or different scenes. Of, of the film. And that kind of like got us a completely new tool. Uh, we 
no matter what what was the length of the uh, film, it took only eight minutes time, and our results were really great. Two point three percent more minutes to viewing. Uh, conversion rate was four of four point eight. So people came to watch. They watched longer. They find more watch things to watch, and then they watch more diverse content. So they went into and, and find something else also to uh, to watch, not only the thing that they thought that they would come to watch. And this was really, really uh, kind of like giving us more understanding. Okay, maybe there's something even more where we should look. So when we went from video scene shot to images, we thought that, okay, could we go back to the shot and scene part? And what happened there was that we have two few cases on our mod. We could preview videos, marketing videos, timeline, and annotations for people to skip, for example, in the films. Uh, and this was really interesting uh, uh, project. As you may know, the short boundary detection that's kind of like uh, uh, like a fixed issue in the ML world at the moment. But for us, uh, there's a lot of lot of issues still. Uh, what we are not uh, what we haven't solved yet. But what we did was that uh, we used uh, we looked on uh, the different lane to the image part as well as we uh, had the soundtrack on on a different. Uh, feature vector, and then we use the search uh, algorithm to find kind of the most logical uh, shots or scenes uh, from from the films, and then we tried it out. And for us, it, obviously, uh, again, we could see that uh, the conversion rate went up, and also the minutes, so that people they actually not only started to watch they also watched until the end of the show and that was that was really interesting part for us uh, because it kind of like made us understand that not everything has to always be done uh, by humans but the machines can do a lot of stuff at the moment and obviously for us that if you want to personalize for example trailers or videos uh, it's not that far away anymore but you can actually do it fairly um not necessarily fairly easy but you can do it and that's something what we are looking more into at the moment but yeah in conclusion three points uh for us we try to build people and teams that can perform so it means that uh you can go to production you can test stuff you need to test stuff because only the data gives you feedback what you should do better uh, second part, create better language about success. Talk about more about what does success actually look like to your teams, to your company. And then in the end, we are what we believe. We find what we go looking for and what we predict comes to pass. That's something something that uh, it's always good to be in, in, in the mind that uh, what you try to do most likely, that's what you are going to get. And if you're not doing something, then you're not going to get anything. So. That was my my talk for today. Thanks for them who joined. And if you have any questions, I think there's a few minutes still left for you to uh, ask them. Wow, that great. That was wonderful, Yako. Thank you so much. Uh, just had a question coming in. I'm just grabbing it. Um, how uh, the question is? How's the hybrid staff? How is the hybrid staff model working? Some people in the business and some people outside of that central office. How is that hybrid staff model working? Is the question. Uh, it's it's <laughs> it's working, but it's not working easily at the moment. So that kind of takes more ma maintenance, especially on the human part, uh, because I think it's easier uh, when everything is structured. So then everybody everyone knows kind of. Uh, what is expected pro from them and, and so forth. So it, it requires much more more maintenance from kind of like HR part or a competence team or uh, how would you like to think. So you need to have, it, you cannot do it that by yourself. You need your teams around you to also work for the same idea. Great answer. Well. And different. Thank you, thank you. Um... So there's, we'll do one quick one. We'll go for a couple minutes over time. How long do you think uh, personalized previews and trailers take to come into existing? How can we expect these personalized previews and trailers to come soon? How far away are we from this? 
uh, there, there, there's a bigger problem with um, um, because nowadays there is uh, the is issue is that usually the sound track starts uh, before the image. So there is a few, for example, the scene detection part. There is a few uh, things we haven't got to solve yet. Uh, so, for example, for us, there are there are things we don't know how to solve them yet. But I hope that when kind of those things, and at the same time also, how do you? It's it's easier to understand what is a good quality image and and what is not. But not trailers. It's a different thing because you don't want to, for example, give away the plot in the mm. trailer and so forth. So that's kind of the, uh, so. There's like quality issues inside. Uh, interesting, interesting. Listen, unfortunately, uh, we are over time. I could uh, talk with about hours on this. Uh, I probably will connect with you offline. Thank you so much for joining us, Jaco. I uh, hope to see you in some of the other sessions. And thank you, everyone, who joined us. Take care.